focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable. The thought league that brings you revolutionary ideas that are immediately actionable. Now the new paradigm, a progressive approach to corporate governance designed by Martin Lipton. And we have with us none other than the man himself, Martin Lipton, joining us straight from New York. And how is this paradigm really going to be adopted in India and where are we in that journey? To throw more light on that, we have with us Cyril Shroff of Cyril Amarchand Mangal Das. Gentlemen, so good to have you on CNBC TV 18. My first question to you, Martin, how have we really evolved? What has been the journey from the shareholders' prominence and primacy to now stakeholders having a say in terms of the corporate governance framework? Well, it's, it's been a long, long journey started in 1932 when a Harvard professor by the name of Merrick Dodd and a Columbia professor by a, named Adolph Burley debated shareholder primacy versus stakeholder governance. It's been going on ever since. Uh, uh, in 1962, uh, the Nobel laureate uh, Milton Friedman wrote a treatise in which he uh, rec not just recommended, but uh, uh, stated doctrinally that the only way to um, manage corporations was through shareholder primacy. Uh, that has been debated ever since uh, in 1979. Uh, 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 I wrote a law review article uh, recommending stakeholder uh, governance. Um, 1985, the Supreme Court of Delaware decided a number of cases, leaving the question somewhat unanswered. Uh, uh, one case uh, clearly saying uh, shareholder primacy to other cases. Uh, basically supporting uh, stakeholder governance. We had the Millennium Bubble in 2000, 2001 with the Enron and WorldCom scandals. Uh, Congress enacted the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation um, imposing uh, new corporate governance uh, requirements on companies. Uh, we, uh, nothing much changed. Um, uh, the pressure for short-term performance kept increasing. Finally, it blew up in 2007, 2008. We had the fiscal crisis. Congress reacted with the Dodd-Frank legislation. Uh, and while the legislation didn't make that much difference, uh, the public attitude and the uh, recognition by uh, both companies and uh, investors that short-termism was causing a very significant problem, uh, we began to get a real reaction against a shareholder primacy with prominent uh, uh, lawyers, economists, um, uh, and investors recognizing that there needed to be a shift yes. from shareholder primacy and short-termism to a new paradigm for management. Sure, Martin. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the long journey that you were talking about. And uh, there were many milestones for uh, reaching uh, to a successful outcome on these terms. But then Cyril Shroff, help us reflect. In India also, we've had several spurts of events which have led us towards stakeholder governance. But where do we stand when it comes to the global standards of governance? Uh, in, in India has had a very interesting journey and it's been shaped not only by Indian events, but also by global events. And I think India has responded in multiple ways. 
by both by legislation as well as regulation. So there are five points which stand out in terms of the Indian framework for stakeholder governance. Firstly, legislation. So section 166 of our Companies Act mandates stakeholder governance. And that's a massive departure from the previous concept of shareholder primacy. It also defines the stakeholders, which is the company itself, employees, uh, other stakeholders, the communi community and the environment. And it also treats all of these on par. There is no hierarchy. We also codify the fiduciary responsibilities of care, skill, and absence of conflict on the board. So that's point number one, which is a great starting point. The second, we have the national guidelines for responsible business conduct, uh, which is founded essentially on Gandhian principles, but it has much wider development goals, including ESG goals. And in turn, it is inspired by the UN principles. Hmm. The third piece that we have in our policy book is our corporate social responsibility. And as you know, uh, since uh, the 2013 Act, we've made it part of the statute itself. So every corporation is expected to contribute up to 2% uh, of its uh, uh, net income to, uh, uh, to for corporate social responsibility objects. And in 2018-19, we contributed about 18,000 odd crores for several projects. The fourth piece that we have is in our SEBI listing regulation, the LODR, which makes it mandatory for corporate uh, for corporates to follow uh, uh, these principles and rules. And lastly, more recently, we have uh, adopted as a mandatory matter business responsibility reporting. So we're still not there on integrated reporting, which we, many companies are doing that, but it is more on a directory and a voluntary basis. So actually, we uh, India packs quite a punch. Uh, as far as stakeholder governance is concerned. So you listed out uh, many of these points which lead us towards that, uh, Cyril Shroff. But one important question and very brief answer from you on uh, why India is so ambitious in tapping global, global capital right now is looking at foreign listings. How are we different and how much ground needs to be covered to reach the global standards like the US markets? So we have similarities and several differences, both uh, from a policy as well as a cultural perspective. So we follow a more tropicalized version. And I would say that uh, the Indian system is, we are more governance adolescents. We are not completely adult if you take the Western standard, nor are we sort of starters or youngsters. We're somewhere in the middle and many points stand out. Uh, firstly, we, we've also, we've closed the debate on stakeholder model. We put it in our statute. Uh, our shareholding and ownership pattern is very different. As you know, we have controlling shareholders, as called, we call them promoters or sponsors, as compared to the Western model, which is largely institutional. Uh, the other big difference in India is the fact that we haven't evolved much jurisprudence from our judiciary. Part of the reason why the, the Western model and the, particularly the US model works is mm. because the courts, court system through class actions or otherwise imposes a certain kind of behavior and risk on the boards. Now that sure. is absent and we'll, I'll come to that as, as we go late. So we are very different. Yeah, so we are very different. But Martin, one important question and from there, you know, a lot of things emanate. What's the purpose of a corporation in your view? Well, in my view, the purpose of a corporation is to conduct a profitable business uh, observing all the legal requirements, a lawful business, an ethical business, one that produces sustainable profits designed for the ultimate objective of increasing the value of the corporation hmm. as distinguished from maximizing value for the shareholders. And in operating under those uh, goals, the uh, uh, corporation takes into account and the directors have a fiduciary duty to the shareholder, but also to the employees, the customers, the suppliers, and the community. And I use community in a very broad sense. Community includes not only the local communities where uh, 
the companies operate, but it includes the national and global communities mm -hmm. and uh, the environment. And uh, I, I often point to the very uh, short answer that Colin Mayer, a professor at Oxford University, uh, uses. He says that the purpose of a corporation is to produce profitable solutions for people and planet and do harm to neither. Sure. I think it's a very uh, apt and not an appropriate way of describing what the purpose of a corporation, a business corporation in today's world should be. All right. Uh, so you spoke about uh, the purpose of the corporation and then we reflected on the stakeholder governance. Cyril Shroff brought about the point of ESG uh, driven uh, capital now. How does the trinity of these factors really work towards driving global capital at the moment? Well, I think that um, all three are uh, uh, significant and are uh, factors that have to be taken into account. I think that uh, the single most important thing is to recognize that uh, all the different issues have to be taken into account. We cannot have uh, a world in which we focus on business corporations only and ignore the interests of both the environment and all of the people who are stakeholders in corporations. Hmm. Right. Uh, so, all right, uh, Martin. So, we have discussed the stakeholder governance, but we'll discuss more tenets of the new paradigm and also what are we to achieve through this new paradigm of corporate governance. So, Martin Lipton as well as Cyril Shroff. Hold on to your thoughts and we will take a very short break on the Thought Leak and come back and discuss more on the new paradigm. Welcome back. You're watching the Thought League and we are discussing the new paradigm of corporate governance. We have with us Martin Lipton as well as Cyril Shroff. Now, Cyril Shroff, uh, we were talking about the tenets of the new corporate governance standards. But what is it that we are ultimately looking at achieving through this? So, uh, uh, Nisha, I, the, uh, the new paradigm or the new principles of corporate governance create intrinsic value. And if I can now sort of take this and put it in an Indian context, I think I'd like to make two points. Firstly, that uh, the Indian origins go back many hundreds of years. I think the real roots of uh, this concept in India are both spiritual and cultural. Even in Colin Meyer's book, the book that uh, Marty refer referred to, on the inside cover page is a picture of uh, goddess Lakshmi. And I think a lot of his concepts, which he refers to, are based on the concept of dharma, where wealth has to be used for a larger purpose. So India's uh, sort of tryst with good corporate governance and the ethical use of wealth go back to uh, the very roots of our civilization. Putting it in a kind of more modern context, I think the benefits are immense. Uh, firstly, the obvious one on stock performance because you create long-term value because you increase the value of the corporation, not just the value to the shareholders. You get a governance premium. Uh, it creates a better chance for long-term survival. You create also intergenerational equity as well. So as you know, a large part of corporate India is uh, still promoter and sponsor controlled where each generation thinks that it has got a duty to really create wealth for the next generation. So a long-term approach, which is kind of sponsor or promoter driven creates intergenerational equity as well. And you can't do that without following a, the broader principles of stakeholder governance, which has now fitted quite nicely into this idea of, uh, of the new paradigm. So uh, I think uh, to, to put it uh, briefly, I think the new paradigm has extreme resonance in India. Its roots go back a long time and it creates tremendous long-term value. So uh, I think it's very appropriate for the Indian culture and the Indian business environment. 
But Martin, how does one strike a balance in this? Uh, and how does one really differentiate between profit and profiteering? Well, the way to strike the balance is to have uh, boards of directors uh, who uh, essentially uh, uh, manage the balance among the different stakeholders. We uh, assign to the board of directors of the corporation the fiduciary duty to use their reasonable business judgment to decide um, on uh, how uh, each stakeholder of the corporation is going to be treated with an overriding objective to increase the long-term value of the company and with another overriding executive, an overriding uh, purpose uh, to uh, not uh, create environmental problems, not to create climate problems of the kind that we're trying to deal with today. Um, and the way in which to solve the possible different objectives of the institutional investors and asset managers who own the shares and are the shareholders on one hand, and all the other stakeholders on the other hand, is that there is engagement between the directors of the company and the shareholders, these investors, institutional investors, and through that engagement, uh, the two sides work out uh, the strategy that both are satisfied with for the operation of the corporation. In other words, uh, each of the companies and the investors uh, engage with each other to achieve a mutual objective of um, ESG, uh, corporate social responsibility, all of the things that Cyril just mentioned as uh, objectives. All of those are objectives to be uh, achieved. The big problem that we've had is, as you know, power is in the hands of the shareholders. They're the ones who elect the board of directors. Sure. So it's critical that the investors endorse the same stakeholder in ESG and sustainability principles that we look to corporations to in endorse. That has been the difficulty to date. And it's that that we're continuing to work on so that through this engagement, we do get a general agreement with respect to how corporations are going to operate and take care of the interests of all of the stakeholders, including environment. So common goal alignment of uh, your uh, goals as well as communications. Uh, these are the key factors that you mentioned, but Martin, also you mentioned about uh, the environment, the sustainability, and probably uh, the entire ecosystem has a way of really pushing the reset button. Probably that's what we are seeing in the pandemic situation right now. But in this crisis, how do you see um, the overall gamut in terms of the corporate governance standards? Have we gone a step backwards or is it time to leapfrog into another level? Well, uh, crises like uh, pandemics or um, other uh, uh, macro events that threaten uh, the future uh, obviously are difficult to deal with. And uh, I think we should not allow uh, the, the criticism of corporations for reducing employment or taking other actions in connection with a pandemic as saying they were disregarding stakeholder governance. It's a balancing uh, act and an, it's obvious that there's no way to completely 
resolve it other than for government to step in and government has to support uh, the corporations and the employees um, in order to uh, get through something like a pandemic. And that's what pretty much around the world we've been doing. Government has stepped in to provide uh, help to the employees who are no longer uh, being employed. And at the same time, to keep companies from going into bankruptcy and going completely out of business. And it's a balancing question that has um, disrupted the politics of just about every country that has been uh, um, damaged by the pandemic. Yes, so each, uh, you know, company and each government is reacting in a different fashion uh, given their circumstances. But Cyril Shroff, how about India and the governance standards right now? In a crisis situation when survival is the first thing on everybody's mind, is there an execution risk to it? Uh, Nisha, short answer to your question is, yes, there is an execution risk. But this is actually both the finest moment as well as the most challenging moment. The, the current pandemic and the situation that uh, exists before boards is where the need for a stakeholder model, including ESG principles, is the greatest that there ever has been. The need to protect the employees, uh, the need to protect the community is, is right out there and it is extremely important. But it is also a time when it has where the boards are facing the greatest challenges in terms of the trade-offs that they have to make. On the one hand, they want to raise capital in order to sort of withstand the shock, but capital uh, has different expectations in in terms of uh, of returns. And to keep the corporation alive, they might sometimes need to act in a more short-term or a commercial way to stay afloat. So uh, I think that this conflict I think is very sharp just now. And what we're seeing, particularly in the Indian context, is a lot of gatekeeper anxiety because mm. the independent directors are, are sort of wondering which direction to go. Mm. But they have been charged with the responsibility of sort of looking after, uh, uh, looking after some of these principles. And they are probably the custodians of this. So they are a confused lot just now, thank you. All right. So uncertainty everywhere and you're uh, calling it a confused lot. But uh, the survivors are the ones who come out stronger out of any crisis situation. Thank you so much, Martin Lipton, as well as Cyril Shroff, um, on the principles of uh, the new paradigm. But the challenge always lies in taking the new paradigm from concept to mindset to practice. And who are those key stakeholders, participants, as well as the tools in regulatory framework, which really help safeguard high corporate governance standards. So we will take up um, that particular aspect in depth uh, in our next episode of The Thought League with Martin Lipton as well as Cyril Shroff. Thanks so much for tuning in. Focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable.